Welcome. Happy Diwali to everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Summercraft. I'm Dean of the Pamplin College of Business, Virginia Tech Business School, and I am so pleased to have a number of you here for the Wells Fargo Distinguished Lecture Series. This is our most prestigious lecture series in the college, and it gives us a chance to have students learn things beyond the classroom. We bring in successful leaders, we bring in people who will share some of their personal insight into business problems and world problems, issues that are going to affect your lives personally and affect all of us in some way. This is, uh, this is a time when you get a chance to hear from people in their personal perspective. Now, uh, all of us are really grateful to Wells Fargo for having started this speaker series several years ago now. We have learned all these students know this very well. We've learned a lot about how to use technology effectively. And so I'm glad to see that we've got a lot of people in the room, but this is the first time that we've had a hybrid Wells Fargo lecture. So we've got uh, a number of students and others who are on the Zoom with us today, and they'll be able to participate. Um, we can unmute them and let them ask a question, but we've had to disable the, the chat function and the Q&A function. So um, after uh, a lecture, you'll get a chance for more of a formal Q&A session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Anisha Fritz. Dr. Fritz is a highly successful scholar, executive, and entrepreneur. Dr. Fritz received both her master's and her PhD from Virginia Tech, focused in strategic management. While a doctoral student, she studied under Dr. Robert Litchin, who, as those of us who were here at that time, know he was a highly respected member of the faculty of the academy, and he was head of the management department. I want to recognize Jan Janice Litchard, Bob's widow, who's with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Early, early in her career, Dr. Fritz was a professor. She taught at uh, Florida International University in Miami, and she taught internationally. She was at the Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden. Anisha's global business experience spans 25 years, and it goes through uh, multiple sectors, including supply chain management, humanitarian relief, and most recently, ultra premium wine and nap. And by the way, uh, we were just talking before the, the uh, lecture is starting, and She's written uh, numerous articles on all of these areas, including some uh, publications on wine recently. So maybe she'll tell you more about that. As the proprietor and director of uh, consumer experience at Linmar State Winery, Denise has built an extraordinary suite of experiences, including a, an excellent restaurant and lodging on site at the winery. Now I'd like to show you a short video to help you understand just what she's built at Linmar. So can we do the video? We're walking the vineyards with a variety of friends that said it must be great to own Lindmar. We don't own anything, we just have access. And it gave me a perspective to say, hey, what we're really doing here is being respectful to the access that we have with a very special place, with a confluence of good fortune that allowed us you know, to be here. And it creates a humility and, and a sense of abundance that I had ever, never experienced before. We're off the beaten path, off this small little road, but we're this beautiful property that has a very intimate quality to it. At Linmar, we're small. We want to meet every one of our customers every day. It's validating the way that we're expressing ourselves through our wine and through hospitality. Lynn Fritz is, is very hands-on, very involved, and I, I think that really sets us apart. Everybody came here to say, may I work here? I've heard about this. I want to be part of it. Then I know we have a successful organization, and that was absolutely at the heart of, uh, of why we do this because uh, uh, this, is a, this is an expression. You know, wine is an expression, a balanced expression of the underlying theory here at uh, Linmar is the whole has to be bigger than the sum of the parts. It has to be. The Linmar experience is an encapsulation of everything that is Sonoma County. The exceptional terroir here, the abundance of the earth, 
and how it manifests in the grapes. When people show up and visit here, we encourage people to stay, hang out, have a good time, uh, walk through the gardens. People actually do get lost here. They'll, they'll end up spending the rest of the day. Weather here is, is, is probably the most elementary factor of the quality we're able to produce. The elements that keep it that way is that we're only 12 miles to my left shoulder here to the uh, ocean, which is really how we derive the name Lynn Mar, Lynn for myself and Mar of the sea, so to really to emphasize uh, the maritime aspects of this particular property. We focus almost entirely on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grapes. Uh, we have many, many different clonal selections. In the case of Pinot Noir, there's 14 distinct clones, all farmed from Budwood, from what we think are the best vineyards in this area. Uh, Chardonnay, we have four clones of, uh, of Chardonnay. This weather's important for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in particular, so that we don't lose the acidity. We have a nice balanced wine at the end of the uh, growing season. It's not a wine, it's a whole array of wines that are assembled from a whole array of different elements in the vineyard. Our consumer base is driven to understand not only the wines themselves, but where they came from and, and why there's complexity and, and layers in, in what we're doing. I think it makes the whole experience much more rich and enjoyable for, for people when they really get a very in-depth understanding of, of everything that we're doing. Lynn and I have worked very hard to create a family environment. So it's really a, a very tight sense of community at Linmar. All of our wine club members, everybody who comes and visits here, consider part of the family. But it's not just wine, it's wine, food, and uh, company. We have two full-time chefs on our property. For anybody that truly enjoys wine and the experience of food and wine, it's a marriage. So we wanted to get the best chefs with the best produce that we grow ourselves. We really are here to create and develop people that have a belief system about Linmar. Not only the product, but what we do, why we do it, and our value system. When an experience enhances your core or speaks to your soul, it goes into your memory bank. And I think the Linmar experience will speak to your soul. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. Fritz as our speaker for tonight's evening. Good evening, everybody. It's kind of strange to be here all these years later because um, I know exactly how you feel sitting back in those seats. I also started my teaching career here, uh, teaching in classrooms just like this. So it's also strangely emotional to be here, which I didn't expect when you were talking about Dr. Richard. I actually teared up because the reason I'm here today is to acknowledge his role in my life. And uh, 30 years from now, you might be standing here uh, talking about how your Virginia Tech experience changed you. Um, I think it's a privilege. It's a privilege and an honor to be here because the Virginia Tech experience that I had did change me and it opened the world to me. So thank you, Dean Samakras, Devi, uh, faculty and students for having me here. Um, it's hard to sort through your thoughts when all these memories are flashing public. <laughs> Why did I show that film? For a couple of reasons. I showed the film because I heard there are some students here from the School of Hotel Ma and Tourism Management. Are there? Hospitality. Hospitality and Tourism Management, anyone? No. All business school students? Okay. They, they might be out there online. On Zoom. If you're on Zoom, hello. I also showed the film to illustrate to you how unlikely it is for somebody that came to this country as a 17 year old student from India with one red suitcase and $200 to end up at a winery in Northern California. <laughs> Honestly, at 17, I didn't even know what wine was. Uh, I barely knew where California was. And so my theme today is about the randomness of life. All of you are probably here because of random circumstances. We don't decide when we're five years old, we're going to go to Virginia Tech. When you graduate from high school, you're probably 
applying to a number of different colleges. And then one thing leads to another, and for whatever reason, you end up here. And then when you're here, you're all in this room, probably. I mean, you could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here. Uh, and then like that, you meet people, and one thing leads to another. Uh, and it's only when you look back, as I am right now, 30 years later, on a career that's, you know, spans three decades, that you see the big picture. I think of life as a tapestry. A tapestry is a piece of cloth that's with a picture woven onto it. But the picture is woven with different colored threads in a discontinuous pattern, one small piece at a time. And, and it, you don't actually see it till it's almost finished. And so I want you to get a sense and think about where you want to be in the years. And I guarantee that's not where you're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> because I certainly didn't think I would be there or here. I, so given that it's a random um, a story about random uh, circumstances, I am going to use my time today to talk about three stories um, that illustrate three phases of my life. Uh, I say it's an unscripted life because it's been all over the place and circuitous. Uh, I just, you know, got an undergraduate degree in business, landed here by chance and circumstance, and then everything has been chance and circumstance. But I think my lesson to you, because I was asked to reflect on my path and see how it could have an impact for you, what you might learn. And you're learning great things in the classroom. You're learning the technical aspects. You have fabulous professors here. So I'm not gonna talk about things they would talk about because they are much more accomplished than I am uh, and capable of teaching you. But what I'm gonna do is reflect a little bit on, on sort of three careers that I've had. Um, in academia, in disaster relief, and now in hospitality and wine, and try and piece through some threads to see that maybe, maybe there'll be a takeaway for you. So story number one, as I said, I came to the United States with one red suitcase. I had an uncle who encountered me in India. He lived in the United States. He encountered me in India at 16, and I think he sussed out then that I wasn't going to follow the traditional script. And so he invited me, which would have been to go to college, have an arranged marriage, have a few children. And I don't know what he saw in me, but I think he knew that I would be a disaster at that path. <laughs> um, so he said, would you like to go to the United States and go to college? I'll pay for your undergrad. Now, my mother was a teacher. My father was in the military. Uh, we weren't a wealthy family, so this was a huge bonus, but I didn't want to be a charity case forever. So I went, uh, went to school in the summer, took evening classes, finished in three years. And there I was, 20 years old. Now what? You know. So being a foreign student, I couldn't apply for a job. The economy wasn't particularly good at that time. Uh, I had nowhere to go. My uncle and aunt who had brought me over were going to travel for that summer. So another aunt, you know, Indian families, they were no bigger than other families, but we, they, we track everybody. And today is Diwali, so if there's anybody from India here or in Nepal or the subcontinent, happy Diwali. Um, so um, I went to another aunt's house and I was just spending the summer there babysitting and trying to figure out what my path would be. Um, when I encountered another relative, and I had applied to a lot of graduate programs, um, MBA programs, and I actually received admission into several, several programs uh, at Ivy League schools, but none of them offered funding, and so they were out of the question for me. So this aunt who was watching on Zoom said, why don't you apply for a doctoral program? She had just finished her doctoral program from the business school at Virginia Tech. It wasn't the Pamplin School yet. And so I said, okay. And she said, I just finished my PhD in finance. Would you like to do it in finance? And I said, absolutely not. Because, uh, <laughs> I knew I wouldn't be good at finance. <laughs> so, um, but I was 20 years old and I'd taken, you know, I had an undergraduate degree from Loyola College in Maryland, which is a liberal arts school. So I had a degree in management, but it was in management sort of by name because we were 
required to take philosophy and theology. And so maybe I took one marketing class, two management classes, uh, an economics class, and that was my business major. So um, I applied for human resources. And it just so and just so happened that at that time, Dr. Richard, who was the head of department, uh, was looking for an experiment. He had talked to the business school deans and said, we'll do an experiment where we'll invite an undergraduate student to come into the doctoral program or a master's degree along the way and see whether that works out. Hmm. And so when he received my application, he uh, called me and he said, we like your application, we like your GMAT scores. Uh, can you come here for an interview? So I looked at how to get to Blacksburg. And I was, remember, I was in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> Getting from Lincoln, Nebraska to Blacksburg, Virginia was not easy and neither was it cheap. So Dr. Lichert, whose wife is here, uh, and thank you for being here, Dennis, I said, um, so I called me back the next day and said, okay, let's arrange an interview on such and such day. And I said, um, it's too expensive. I can't afford to come for an interview. So then he used to go running around the drill field every day. Uh, he was a runner. So he, and he'd always call me. He'd finish his run, have his shower in the gym, come back to his office, and I would be the first call. And, you know, that for those few weeks we talked, I felt like practically every day. So, um, so then he said, okay, we'll interview you on the phone. This was before Zoom and before laptops mm -hmm. and before um, any way to communicate other than those dial telephones, um, which you've probably never seen. <laughs> um, so he called and um, I talked to a couple of professors and they accepted me into the program. And then on the next week when he went for his run, he stopped at the Horn student office and um, made sure I got the right papers. And then the next day when he ran, he <laughs> went to the student assistance um, office and sort of made sure I had an assistantship. So I arrived in Blacksburg one fall and it was gorgeous fall. I'm just looking at the trees uh, today brought back memories of that fall because until today, that was the most beautiful I had ever seen Virginia Tech. He brought me here. I was on a full assistantship, $700 a month, which to me was a huge fortune. And um, I was the assistant to one of the professors in the management department. And I signed up for the first, they told me to sign up for two statistics and a calculus class. Mm -hmm. At the end of the first semester, after an undergraduate degree, I got one B minus and two Cs. I was immediately on academic probation. <laughs> so Bob Ledger came back to me and he said, you better become my doctoral assistant and you better major in strategy. And that's how I came to be a strategy major. And that's how, and so um, if it hadn't been for Dr. Richard, I would not have come to Virginia Tech. I would not have been a strategy major. And I don't know what my path would have been. So my lesson from that story is there are so many kind people out there. There are so many kind people here. When you're here, notice them, take advantage of them. Your professors can be huge advocates. And for the next five years, I was his um, acolyte, I would say. Uh, because he, I, I worshiped the ground he walked on and because he was, but he was a very distinguished researcher. And so I finished my PhD. Um, I went on, I started teaching at Florida International University. I started to live that script, right? Become a professor, publish, teach, loved it. Um, but about 1996, I had another experience. The dean of my university said to me, he said, I had just made tenure, I'd done the publications, and he said, there was this businessman in town. And, you know, just like you were asked to come to my speech, he asked me to go and watch this speech by this businessman who was visiting Miami because he thought there would be a, a potential crossover with what we were doing at the College of Business where I was also running an executive so I went to the speech and, uh, you know, for the faculty here, when a dean 
asks you to do something. <laughs> sort of grit your teeth and do it. <laughs> you say you smile, but sometimes you don't always want to. <laughs> So I went and uh, under duress because my dean asked me to go. Uh, what I really wanted to do was go home. Um, and I sat on the very last row, probably where you were sitting, um, and sort of pretending to listen to the person that was talking. <coughs> and as the person went on and on and on, I turned to the person next to me and used a word I shouldn't have used and said, I think this person's full of. And I won't use that word. And the person next to me said, why do you say that? So we had this whispered conversation. Imagine if the two people in the back were having a conversation in loud whispers, especially. And um, so turns out that the person that I talked to was really the main act. And the person that was talking in front was a warm up act. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the CEO of a very large company, the one that I had come to impress. And here I was, <laughs> not on script again. So um, he got up and he said, I was talking with Dr. Thomas in the back, and she doesn't agree. There were about 200 people in the room. She doesn't agree with our value proposition. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so after after the talk, because uh, he was who he is, he thought the press came to me. What did you say to him? You know, they wanted to interview. <laughs> anyway, he had a conversation with me, and he said, "What do you do?" And I told him what I did, and uh, I told him that my dissertation at Virginia Tech had been about matching managers to strategy, which is sort of. Um, if you have a particular strategy, there are certain managers that do better with that strategy than other managers. He's like, that's perfect. I uh, have this large company that I run, and it was a uh, Fortune 1000 company. And he said, uh, I'm thinking of hiring a new CEO. And would you consult with me and help me select a new person? I've never done any consulting in this area. This is how faculty operates sometimes. But it was very exciting because I knew all the theory. And, um, and Virginia Tech had equipped me well. I felt like I had frameworks. My brain was trained. It had opened my mind. So I said, sure. And so I helped him hire the new CEO. And he was not very good. It's actually quite bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to take responsibility for it. I was the only consultant. He made the decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next thing was that if the company um, because the CEO was so bad, um, and this transition, the succession plan didn't work. He, um, he started to look to sell the company. And so started to go to prospective people in, uh, who were potential buyers. There was a lot of interest in the company. It was a very successful company. It was a logistics and supply chain company called the Fritz Companies. And um, so... We, I, I, one day we were sitting at dinner and I said, if you sell the company tomorrow, what will you do with the rest of your life? And he said, I don't know. I would like, all I've done for my whole life is logistics and supply chain. So he was one of the architects of logistics and supply chain as we know it today. Uh, he was, it was the first IPO in the supply chain industry. He was a person that, that coined the word um, logistics of, uh, global logistics and used it in a commercial sense for the first time. So he said, all I know is logistics is supply chain. So we'd have to find a way where it can, I want to do something with it, but I don't need to make a lot of money. I want to use it for good. And as he was talking, my mind was worrying. And remember, because I've, I've done my PhD, sort of the first thing when I get new information, as you will, because when you get out there here, you're around people who know more than you all the time. Well, when you get out there, you'll see you become, and so you start, and if you've made the most of your education, you will be able to ask questions. So I said, what? And I said, what about disaster relief? Really? It would appear that logistics and supply chain management is particularly appropriate and applicable in disaster relief. Really. Like, that's great. That's a great idea. Why don't you find out? So he, um, funded me to go to Geneva and New York and um, meet with the Red Cross and, and UNICEF and the World Food Organization and 
all these large NGOs that did work in disaster relief. And I had to really like navigate these organizations to find their logistics managers. And usually they'd be in the basements, you know, nobody <laughs> actually knew their name. You know, logistics was not a glamorous profession. Anyway, long story short, found them and we brought them together and started to talk to them about what their challenges were. And they said they had four challenges. The, the four challenges were, they weren't recognized. Nobody gave them importance. They only got money when there was a disaster. There was no education for logisticians. They were essentially people uh, who knew something about something or um, offered to go out when there was a disaster and, and, and procure trucks. And, uh, and you know, when there's a disaster and the roads are broken and there's no warehousing and the airports have closed down, um, you know, somebody has to go there and figure out how to get goods in. And so I started so started to talk to these people and um, they wanted more recognition. They wanted more resources. They wanted to be seen as a strategic function and they wanted process. Uh, and so I spent the next 10 years of my life working on logistics with Lynn Fritz, who was a person that I had failed in the first project for. <laughs> the second project worked. Uh, so I left academia and became the executive director and for the next 10 years traveled to 30 or 40 countries a year uh, from disaster venues to Davos, just looking, you know, trying to connect the dots because all the resources were in this bucket, all the need was in this bucket. Uh, did I know anything about logistics? No. Did I know anything about disaster relief? No. But I knew how to ask questions. I had a strategic framework. Uh, I had the training and research, and so we figured it out, broke the script again. So, and you know, being at Virginia Tech and studying and learning under Bob Lichert, Rich Wilkes, who was on my committee, um, and some of the other amazing faculty here, my mind was open, as I hope yours is. Uh, but working in disaster relief opened my heart. You know, I, I'll never forget once being uh, in Sri Lanka after the Indian Ocean tsunami, which killed over 250,000 people in 12 countries. And the whole villages were wiped out because this wave came in and just dropped. And um, I went in a few days later and I saw this train. And this train was, you know, a few miles in from the beach, it had been completely flooded. It had been full of people and everybody within that train passed away. By the time I got to the train, it had been cleared out. You could just see, you know, uh, the empty carriages and the water and the seaweed at the bottom of the train. And then, so we walked in and we looked at it and then we came back down and I saw this one red sandal. And I could tell it belonged to a woman. And I could tell that she hadn't left it there. And in that moment, it occurred to me how random disasters are, right? That could have been any one of us. I mean, and, and so when you read about a disaster, when I read about a disaster now, I don't think about it in a mass scale. I think about the individual lives that were affected. That woman whose sandal it was probably had children and a mother and a father. And so in disaster relief, what you're doing is then you're encountering those children and the parents. And what logistics does is bring them relief. So you're bringing them supplies, you're bringing them water, you're setting up toilets, you're setting up tents. And, and the field of humanitarian relief is pretty chaotic. But over the 10 plus years that we worked in it, we were able to solve those four problems in some substantial way. We published a lot of research on how disaster relief works. We created technology to track and trace the last mile uh, that's where, you know, things apply, appear at an airport and then you don't know where it goes. So we were able to figure out a process. Um, we were able to create education that could be delivered through distance learning to 110 countries around the world. 
world, and we were able to create a community of practice. And so um, everything that I had in academia and that I learned in academia, I was able to use in disaster aid, random. If I'd stayed in academia, I would never have had this opportunity. Um, and if I hadn't had this opportunity, I'm not sure that as a business school professor with my head in the clouds and doing research, heart would have opened as it did. Um, and one of the lessons here is think about what opens your heart, uh, because it's really the mind and heart together that gives us the ability to have empathy and compassion for our fellow men. And it's also that connection of the mind and the heart that creates community. And I think community, empathy, compassion, whatever field you're in, along with research, training, and the ability to write, ask the right questions are so important uh, that one without the other is an incomplete skill set. And uh, what, I, what I'm very excited about is that your generation in particular, the generation of undergraduates as we're seeing now and the people younger than you are the loudest, most impatient, most demanding, most valuable value-oriented generation you've ever had. And so I'm very hopeful for you because I think your hearts are already open and that you're here to open your minds and that that combination is what our world needs. Um, so one of the legacies of Fritz Institute is that Lynn and I coined a term called humanitarian logistics, referring to the science of logistics. Um, that is applied in humanitarian situations, disasters in particular, where the supply chains are dynamic, right? You don't know what you need. You don't know where you need it. You don't know how you're going to get it there, but you have to figure it out. And so the field made a huge shift, because, not because of anything we did or because of the fact that we brought consortiums and collaborations together. We created public-private partnerships. We created communities of logistics, logisticians that started to work together. There were, uh, we created standard classification of codes. Um, we created, you know, used just some of the practices that were used in business. We applied them um, in the disaster and humanitarian sector. And then lo and behold, over 10 or 12 universities now around the world offer degrees in humanitarian logistics. Mm -hmm. Unscripted. 10 years later. So those two stories were 20 years into my career now. 10 years later, uh, we had the opportunity to do it again in wine. And I realized that people who come into the wine industry are very similar people who work in disaster relief. They're driven by passion. They're driven by fulfilling some inner calling. They're not necessarily driven by money because there's not a lot of money in wine. They're not driven necessarily by professional success, but they like the people, they like being, in, being around the land. And so um, I started working in, I, I wasn't intending to work in the wine industry, didn't know anything about wine didn't know anything about agriculture, because wine is really <coughs> agriculture, production, hospitality, marketing, and sales. And I knew a little bit about hospitality, marketing, and sales, but I didn't know anything. But I started to see the connections to disaster relief, this passion project, the lack of discipline, the lack of really understanding how things connect. And so over the course of 10 years, we built a business model. We had a little winery. It was bleeding money for all kinds of reasons that we can go to in the questions yeah, if you're interested. Um, but it didn't have a business model. Supply and demand were not reconciled. We didn't know who our customers were. Um, you know, we had no understanding of how pricing was done. It was all, you know, imagine um, if a group of people off the street started a winery, <laughs> you know? And that's how it generally is because people come to Northern California or any other one, Burgundy too, because they are other wine regions, which are some of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, they fall in love with the lifestyle. And I understand that because when you are around such beauty, your whole being fills with awe and wonder. 
your whole being notices the cycles of nature. You see you, the clouds. And then when you, when you start to understand how nature affects everything you do and how nature is the boss and all you get to do is work within the framework that she sets out for you, it's very humbling. Uh, and I, you, if you follow the news, you know, for the last four years, we've had devastating fires. We've had a huge flood. Uh, we've lost last year's crop to smoke taint. Uh, so, so now here I am in, in hospitality and wine. And, um, but we've had disasters and everything I learned in disaster relief is starting to bubble up in my mind now. Why are these disasters happening, climate change? What can we do about it? And so sustainability, regenerative agriculture, um, solar power, um, all of those things are in the forefront. Do I know a huge amount about all of those? No, I'm learning. So my message, I guess, to you right now is look at all, be open. Open your mind. You never know when an opportunity is going to show up. You never know where kindness is going to show up. Um, when you're given an opportunity, burnish it. Get good at it. Look for excellence. Um, see how you can use your discipline and your framework uh, and everything that you've learned in your profession to make the most of that opportunity. And then maybe the next one will open up. And then look for things that open your heart to. And then, in my opinion, it's the mind and the heart and the spirit. There's something bigger, that feeling that gives you awe and wonder. You put those three together, and then you have to have a fulfilling life. How can you not? So Lynn said in the video, if you remember or not, why I married Lynn Fritz, and uh, that's why my name is Fritz. Uh, after all of that, how could I not? <laughs> um, his philosophy, which is my philosophy now, is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which is a quote by Aristotle. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And in the video, he added, it has to be. So now my quote is, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It has to be. Um, so think about your parts and how you can make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. That I believe is the key to a fulfilling life. And I found this quote this morning as I was thinking about what to say. And it is by Emerson and he wrote, that the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful. It is to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. So that's my message to you. Be compassionate and use the training that you're getting here for good. Thank you. We have, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, anybody that's fired up, uh, those in Zoom, I, I can't see the questions. Maybe, maybe Jim, Jim is monitoring that. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, questions. Anybody? Um, anything about what she said or her background or, or any other queries you may have? Well, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Any other questions? Um, you said at one point when you were doing like disaster relief um, related work, you were traveling up to 30 countries a year. Um, I'm interested in like what that was like and if you found that to be overwhelming or exciting or just kind of talk more about all that. Um, all of the above. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, I've always wanted to travel. When, when I was seven years old, somebody asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to travel. In fact, my first, if I had had a choice about what I could be when I was little and I could, and if all these random things hadn't happened to me, I would have been a stewardess on an airline because, but I was too short <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted to travel. So I loved it from, till I didn't. 
you know, uh, and it got to be overwhelming. And then you realize you couldn't have a life and that you couldn't really, really be healthy. And, uh, but there was no other way to do the work. I don't know if, if in a pandemic, how we would have done what we did because so much in life and now at Linmar too, is about relationships. That's another reason I came here. And that's another reason why I'm overwhelmed that Mrs. Lishard and, and Rich Wilgich are here because who gets to say 30 years later to the people who changed their life? Thank you. So relationships, right? And so I don't know, I mean, I'm really skeptical about how much work we can really get done with this remote um, office and work from home situation. Um, I have a question about the sustainability that you're working on with your winery. I know you said you're still in the learning stages, but what have you implemented so far and how's that going? Um, so we've implemented, I think, a fair amount. Um, so we are fully solar, but carbon negative. Um, we, um, sustainability is sort of this holistic concept. It's about how you interact with all parts, all the stakeholders and all parts of the organization. So we're very responsible in terms of being members of our community, being connected to our neighbors, being responsible employers and making sure that um, your teams are well taken care of. Um, we also have started, you know, where we farm sustainably, we're certified sustainable, both in the vineyard and the winery. Talk about random things. Our winemaker, who's an award-winning winemaker, guess where he graduated from? Virginia Tech. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we're certified sustainable. So, and then now we're starting to look at the ecosystem of the soil. So only about 20% of the land we own is has vines on it. The rest of it is really, you know, trying to make sure that the whole system uh, from the soil to the plants we have on the periphery to the wildlands to the biodiversity, all of that um, is in balance. I mean, balance is a key component in life, but it's a very key component in nature as a key component in farming. So um, I know that you said unscripted, but but there's kind of like a, a, a correlated flow between the things that you've done. So what's next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. She teaches strategy. I just know to ask the questions and wait for the answers to come. One of the things that Dr. Litcher told me, which I've used every single mo in every single endeavor I've done, is that if you ask the right questions, the answers will suggest themselves. And if the answers are not apparent, ask the question better. Well, because I'm hearing about logistics of the whole of sustainability in the way that you float, that's a relief to the winery. So in my mind, I'm thinking that's the, if I was going to place a bet on the future of your life. Yes, what would you say? <laughs> sustainability, logistics, the logistics of sustainability as more than one thing. Yes. I think sustain, from what I have seen, and there are certainly better experts in this room than I am, from what I've seen, sustainability is still a pretty fragmented concept. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm looking to see how it gets more integrated because you can look at sustainability of the land or sustainability of your packaging or sustainability of how you make wine. But the integration of all of the components, some sort of index of sustainability, some organizational way to measure and manage sustainability is still to emerge. So I'm asking the questions. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, you said that your career has been very random and obviously things coming on as planned at the time. Um, how have you kept from being discouraged when you hit bumps along the way? So my superpower <laughs> is putting one foot in front of the other. And um, I've heard after that recently uh, from uh, that Angela Duckworth refers to that as grit. Uh, you know, just being in. So I think there, there are two things that are important um, when you are educated and and you have choices one is just to keep going um 
and and Lynn refers to this as a last man standing, just persistence, just keep going. Um, I think that's that's really the main one uh, is just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, failure is inevitable. If I hadn't failed at getting into graduate school for an MBA, I wouldn't have come to Virginia Tech. If I hadn't failed at finding a successor for Lynn, I would never have encountered the world of disaster relief. Um, but have I had nights alone crying in my bed, uh, thinking that you know the next day is just going to be the end of my life? Absolutely, uh, plenty of them. And at your age, if you don't have them, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> it's just part of being in your teens and twenties. But it gets better, I promise. <laughs> you get you you know as you grow older, you're able to cope better. Now I'm like, okay, I can handle it, no matter what happens. The question from Rich. Uh, you were talking about the uh, vineyard bleeding money when you first got there. Could you elaborate a little on the situation then and what some of the things were that you did to turn it around? Yeah, so the situation then was that it was a small vineyard that was making excellent wine. It had always made excellent wine. Um, and all the wine was being sold to distributors who then sold it to retail and restaurants. But it was small, right? So when the 2008 crisis hit, the distributors basically said to us, we, we're not going to distribute it with. So we had warehouses full of wine and no way to sell them, sell it. So um, then we said, we're never, ever, ever going to put our faith in somebody else's hands again. Mm -hmm. so, so we had all this wine. There was no business model. My husband and I didn't know that much about wine. Uh, so, but we knew about business models. And so we said, okay, profitability is equal to revenue minus expenses. So let's figure out what our revenue is, what our expenses is, and what, would, what it will take. And it's like, it was that basic. And mm -hmm. then, you know, part of that is aligning supply. So if we're, we have all this wine, don't produce so much because, you know, wine just accumulates cost. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then, then we're like, how do we create a system where we can sell wine directly to consumers so we're not dependent on other people? And that's when we started, you know, significantly enhancing our hospitality program and saying we really need to know every customer that comes through the door and we need to have a relationship with that customer. What will it take to have a relationship with that customer? Um, you know, we need to know what their preferences are. So we built a CRM system. You know, we need to know um, when they come. We need to know uh, how much we can sell directly in what portion, <coughs> et cetera. So it was it was business 101, something that <laughs> you know anybody could have done. And you would just happen to be in that situation. And one thing I've learned after 30 years is that theory and practice are two different <laughs> things. <laughs> so theory is very, very useful and it can reduce your uh, chances of failure. But at the end of the day, practice is about having a happy team, having people that, that want to work for you and believe in what you believe, having people who will represent you to the customer in a way that the customer wants to create a relationship with you and maintain that relationship with you, and all the systems and processes that underlie that so that they have a consistent experience. Even today, you know, in our management, I am the one thing I focus on is taking away all the distractions so that when they come to taste wine, they're tasting wine. They're not worried about whether their credit card's going to work or whether the person greeted them properly or whether they, if they don't know where to sit or any of that. If they have allergies to the food. We take all of that out of the way before they arrive so that they can really focus on the experiential part. Because and then they can notice the beauty and the taste of the wine and, and the connection with the host. Can I ask a follow-up with that? Thank you. I understand your wine is an upscale kind yes. of more upper high. It's a luxury yeah, wine. Luxury wine. So some of the things you just described is exactly targeted to that group, right? But can you talk a little bit more about that? And I'm also wondering how the price competition or anything else that comes from the other competitors and how we deal with that. 
as a, as a luxury brand because I certainly there are different challenges. Well, there are close to 15,000 wineries in the United States now. <laughs> uh, so it's a very competitive field. But as we were talking at lunch, there are barriers to entry and barriers to exit. So with the barriers to exit, some people want to sell wine at all costs, right? Just to, to, to manage cash. Um, so for us, it's about that relationship. And what we found, and that's why I referred to values earlier, as consumers, especially your generation, you care about how we do business, not only what we do, but how we do it and why we do it. And so we pay a lot of attention to those factors. And that is that is where those are the kinds of things that differentiate us. You know, it's what we do and how we do it and why we do it that differentiates us. Then we put that together in a story that we can tell our customers so they can relate to that. Thank you. Any, uh, we may have time for one or two other questions. I, I do have a selfish question I want to ask, but I want to wait. For yeah, one <laughs> oh, there's one. Okay. So, what you're talking about is a disaster. <laughs> that individual person in your story. That was that was really you know, really cool to me. I was just wondering how how do you know how do you go through that and kind of playing around with so many individual people. There's so many different types of people that this might How do you manage that? I mean, I have to know who's target, know, just kind of remember all of that because there's a lot. Well, you, you don't. I mean, when there are hundreds of thousands of people that are affected, you don't come into encounters with them. But I remember why I went to this small little village in Capri di Namibia, you know, um, and so this was during the AIDS crisis. We walked into the village and there were lots of happy little children. But as we got in there, we realized that the only people there were the grandmothers and the children. There was nobody in the work of working age. They had all died. And um, so two things come out of that. One, it's overwhelming. How do you even comprehend that? Um, but two, that's what keeps people motivated to keep doing that, because if not us, then who? I know I asked a question, but um, I had one more related to the disaster relief. You said you were working with a lot of different NGOs or humanitarian organizations with like the people in logistics. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but was there one organization that you think did it the best? Like their supply chain was really good. They knew what they were doing. They're really effective. So it's not an organization. So we, so if you go to our website or, you know, Fritz Institute or look up disaster relief and supply chain, the research that we did and that other people did basically shows that the most effective relief is when there's capacity on the ground. Local people who understand how to take care of their communities. Um, and so when there's that capacity, that's the best kind of relief. Relief that's flown in is temporary. It helps, but it's temporary and it's very expensive. We did Somebody did a study that said 80% of every dollar that you give to disaster relief in another country goes in the administration of it. So if there are local organizations on the ground that know that community and know what it know what the community needs, the relief is more effective. And so that's my answer to it. You know, rather than a big global international organization, it's really capa local capacity that makes the difference. Okay. I'd like to take the last one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm very interested in because you, you, you spoke a lot about the, the customer experience as part of this wine, you know, from production to service, right? You know, this is a fascinating aspect of the industry, hospitality yes. and travel and tourism. So my question is how do you make sure you know you, you create a unique story that you know Nobody actually copy, you know, but to steal, steal the story from you and you, you have the identity. 
I think customers know when something is authentic and when it's not. You know, a stolen story doesn't feel the same when it lands as one that you live. Okay, I think that that'd be the last question. Uh, and uh, on behalf of all, all the attendees, first of all, I wanted to thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I know you have busy time. Uh, it's evening, dinner time and all that. But thank you for coming. I hope you really got a lot out of it. Questions reflect that. A uh, lot of, lot of great insights. Very thrilling life journey, unscripted, but very thrilling and a lot of connections there. Uh, so thank you for coming and, and visiting us, our students and our faculty and the whole team. Welcome back. And that, that, <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's so wonderful to have Janice, you, and, and, and obviously Rich, and, and many others. Um, and, and we really, truly appreciate your coming. So please join me in thanking Dr. Thank you. So we have a small, small uh, Virginia Tech goodies here. I hopefully you'll you'll enjoy taking. And one of those is a friend from the Department of Management. I will really keep this very carefully. Yeah. And thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.